I'm going to talk about something that, you know, I am at the point with CPI, the Center for Political Innovation. We are adjusting as an organization very dramatically because we have to. We have to get the job done and the ground around us is changing. And if we keep we keep going the way we're going, we won't be up to the task. And we are carrying out some very dramatic adjustments in our organization. And one thing that I have learned is that sometimes when there is an issue that just keeps coming up, right? That people that just keeps being raised one way or another, it just keeps coming up. The best thing to do is just take it head on and just dive right into it. Um, and this is an issue, and I, I guess, you know, as, as there's been disagreements in the past, as there's been people that have struggled and been frustrated, this is an issue that has come up a number of times. And it's not just in the Center for Political Innovation that this has come up. It's in our wider circles. It's among anti-imperialists in general. Uh, an issue arises, um, and that issue is the question of normal. How do we reach normal people? Are we normal people? Should we strive to make ourselves more normal? Are we freaks? Are we weird? This is a whole issue that a lot of people get stuck on. A lot of people get stuck on this issue. And, and there's a lot of problems among people that are anti-imperialist, among people that recognize that Russia is right in Ukraine and the NATO regime in Kiev is wrong, among people who realize that Taiwan is China, among people who sympathize with North Korea rather than South Korea, among people that realize that uh, the U.S. invasion of Iraq was based on lies, that the destruction of Libya and the killing of Gaddafi was an atrocity, among people who realize that this global system of imperialism is holding back development around the world and that these wars are waged to protect big banks and oil companies, there is an ongoing identity crisis that a lot of us face. And we need to just, just face it head on. But it's not a simple thing. There are some attempts to give a simple answer to these questions. And when people attempt to give simple answers, it hurts them in the long run. And so we need to talk about this issue of normal. Are we normal? Do we want to be normal? How do we talk to normal people? What, what We need to address this issue head on. We need to just look it in the face and talk about it. Because I've seen a few people with great potential get stuck on this issue lately, and it has destroyed them politically. They have deteriorated into more or less living biologically over this issue. They get stuck on this issue. And I would say the bulk of anti-imperialists that get caught up in wokeism are also stuck on this issue in their own way, and they go in a bad direction. And that this is, this is an issue that we just need to take on head on. So I'm going to start out by clarifying something. And I feel like this should be common sense, but it is not. And I'll just start out and say that as the founder of the Center for Political Innovation, as the ideological leader of the Center for Political Innovation, I want the best for you. I want you to have a happy life. I want you to have a good paying job. I want you to have uh, a spouse that you care for. I want you to have a family that you get along with. I want you to have friends who you can rely on and trust. I want you to have a good, happy, comfortable life. I want you to be confident. I want you to love yourself and be proud of who you are. I want you to be an effective communicator. I want you to be able to win the respect of other people. I want you to achieve great things. I want all of those things for you. And why do I want those things for you? Well, first of all, I want them because I'm a nice guy and I have basic human empathy. And if there's anybody that I wish goodness towards, it's the people that are part of my community. 
right? I mean, if anybody that I, I have I have good wishes and well wishes for, it would be you all, right? But I should, you know, in, 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 you know, basic, you know, morality, you want the best for everybody for the most part, but those you are close to, you're much more invested in them doing well. So I want the best for you. However, in addition to me wanting the best for you, I have another interest in it, which is the better you do, the better we do. The better of a, of a person you are, if you have a good paying job and you have a stable life, you'll be able to be a much more productive, active member of our group. The more that you, uh, you are able to effectively communicate with other people and maintain healthy friendships and relationships, why, the better of an organizer you'll be and the better you will be at bringing people into our organization and recruiting people. Uh, the more that you are a respectable, admirable person, the more that you have achievements, the better our whole organization does. And so in addition to just my basic human solidarity and well wishes towards you and my comradeship for you, it is in the interest of the Center for Political Innovation for you to do well. I want you to be confident. I want you to be successful. I want you to have love in your life. I want you to have meaningful relationships. I want you to have success at your job. I want you to excel in every possible way. I want that for you. Firstly, because I care about you and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a human being. But second of all, because it is in our organization's interest for you to have that. Now, why is it necessary for me to say that? Well, unfortunately, there are other types of movements and organizations and really fandoms that really don't want that for you. How is this related to the question of normal? It's it's related. We'll get to that, but bear with me. There are all kinds of movements and organizations that don't want that for you. Now, why don't they want that for you? Well, they don't want that for you because the way they are set up psychologically is to cultivate dependency. There are a number of organizations, and specifically a lot of internet fandoms that are set up to cultivate people's dependency, to make you reliant on a certain social media influencer or a certain organization for your whole social circle, for your, your any self-esteem, for your livelihood. They're set up to make you reliant on them. And in order to do that, they don't want you to excel. They don't want you to succeed. They definitely don't want you to be confident. They want you to be under their thumb. And that basic dynamic that I'm describing here, I want the best for you. I want you to be successful. I want you to be strong and confident. I want the best for you. And some other people, for a variety of other reasons that are very self-serving, and on top of that are very non-productive, are not going to get us any closer toward defeating imperialism. They don't want that. And that needs to underlie this entire conversation. Because, let's just face it, if you live in the United States of America in the year of 2024, and you are politically literate enough to have studied the Ukraine conflict to realize that Russia is right, and the Kiev junta installed by the United States is wrong, you're not normal. And if you are somebody who has studied world history and come to the conclusion that Stalin was a good guy, you are not normal. 
And if you are somebody who has studied the history of the Korean Peninsula and thinks that Kim Il-sung and the Korean Workers' Party have done some good things, you are not normal. It is abnormal to be an anti-imperialist in an imperialist country. The bulk of the population is pretty tuned out of politics for the most part. And on top of that, the people who are political tend to be pro-imperialist in one way or another. Now, there's a growing section of the population that are skeptical. There's a growing section of the population that are alienated, that are highly distrustful. And that's a good sign in a way. But, I mean, I'm not, I am not going to pretend that being an anti-imperialist in the center of an imperialist country and having anti-imperialist consciousness makes you normal. It's not. You are, you are not normal. And that's fine. That's absolutely fine. Because normal people don't have Wikipedia pages. Normal people don't have world records in the Olympics. Normal people uh, don't write books. Normal people don't uh, travel around the world to important international gatherings. Normal people don't do a lot of the things that being part of this movement empowers you to do. Right? You are who you are because you are unique. You have seen the truth. You have been open enough to see the truth and, and learn the reality of the world around you. And that says a lot about you. It says that you are open-minded in a way that others are not. It says that you are knowledgeable and deeper thinking in ways that others may not be. It says that you've been exposed to certain realities and that you have life experiences that have opened you up to hearing certain perspectives that other people have not had. And none of that is an indictment of you. None of that makes you a bad person. In fact, all of those things are strong arguments in your favor. And I think that you're ahead of the curve if you can understand the way the world actually works. If you can understand the evils of American imperialism. Right? If you can understand the, the benefits of a rationally planned economy and socialism. I mean, not all of this is, is good. I, I think it's all very, very good. It shows that you're ahead of the game. If you were quote-unquote normal, you wouldn't be able to enjoy these broadcasts. If you were quote-unquote normal, you wouldn't be fun to talk to. I would probably I might get bored having conversations with you. So so I don't really want you to be normal and I'll talk more about I'll talk more about that later on about how I don't really want you to be normal. But the question is what do we do with this realization that we are not normal? What do we do about it? That's the question. Because the standard way that leftists deal with this is something that I have actively fought against. In fact, the whole basis of our community and our organization, out of the movement to the masses, has been a rebellion against the standard way that leftists used to talk about this. Because the standard leftist approach is to condemn the society we live in, to condemn all the people around us as sheeple, as, as a bunch of complicit imperialists, white settler colonialists who are bought into this evil system and think that you are somehow morally superior and feel condemnation and isolation from the society in which you live. That is the normal way that people respond to this. I'll give you an example. When I was around the Revolutionary Communist Party, right, we would encounter people when we were selling newspapers who would say, F you, and, you know, get away from here, you commies. Why don't you move to some other country? 
And what we were told was, America is the most evil fucking country that has ever existed. This is the new Nazi Germany. These people go along with their government murdering people in Iraq and murdering people in Central America. And we don't fit in here. And it's an honor to be spit on by the American people because this is an evil fucking country and this is an imperialist hellhole and we are the ones with the morality. We don't consider ourselves to be Americans. We burn the American flag. We, we pride, we take pride in our isolation. That is the mindset of the weather underground. That's the mindset of the Revolutionary Communist Party. That's the mindset of a lot of the woke left nowadays. America is an evil, racist, settler, white country. America is, uh, America is, is a country founded on racism and people who wave the flag and people who just live their lives are complicit in empire and they're morally bad because they're not part of the woke movement and they're going along with an evil system. But we, the enlightened few, we are the correct ones. We are morally good. And, and this country is going to fall apart and burn down. And we'll set, stand back and laugh and go, ha, 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 ha. We knew it was evil all along. Yeah, burn with it, you evil racist white settler. I mean, that is, that is the weather underground mindset. Uh, that is the mindset of the new left of the 1960s and 70s. Uh, that is the mindset of wokeism. And that mindset is toxic. That mindset is toxic. That mindset is not helpful. And that mindset, it leads to depression and demoralization. It leads to hopelessness. It leads to all kinds of very, very bad things. It is not a healthy way of being. But it is the mindset that most of the left cultivates. Moral superiority, contempt for the society you live in, pessimism, negativity. And that ain't going to get us anywhere. I think that's not helpful. And that's going to lead us to be isolated. But what will that lead you to do if you think that way? It will lead you to separate. To more and more isolate yourself. To cut off your friends. To cut off your family. To be isolated alone on the internet. all by yourself. And I must say, a lot of social media cultivates this mindset because it's in their interest. They don't want you to go and have a healthy relationship with your friends, have a healthy relationship with your family, have a good job or anything like that. Well, if you do that, you're not home alone watching them. Right? I mean, they want you to cut off your parents or your friends and relatives because they're Trump supporters. Cut them off. They're racist. I'll never speak to them again. You support genocide. Your, your free speech is genocide. You're a Trump supporter. You know, um, They want you to cut off your leftist friends who disagree with you about the trans thing or disagree with you about this or that or don't use the right pronouns or whatever. Cut them off. I disavow. Ah, they want you to get in your smug, moral, self-righteous place and cut and cut and cut and isolate and isolate and isolate and condemn and condemn and condemn. So you're all by yourself and it's just you and your phone. And they've got you right where they want you. And you are consuming. You're consuming their content. And you're becoming more and more triggered by their content. You're feeling more and more scared, more and more threatened. You're more afraid of the world around you. You're more alienated from your neighbors. You're afraid of your neighbors. You're afraid of your family members. And you're just all by yourself. And you think the world isn't going anyplace. I don't want you to feel that way. That does not benefit me in any way. And it doesn't benefit the Center for Political Innovation in any way for you to feel that way. And 
the idea that we are the moral few. We are the moral few. The idea that, oh, we want to celebrate our difference. I think there was a slogan, freaks are revolutionaries and revolutionaries are freaks. We don't want to be normal in this evil society. Oh, you know, that doesn't lead any place good. But it's very convenient for social media fandoms. Very convenient for them, right? They get to be the voice on the internet, the only one to really understand you, the only one who's there for you with your trauma. Right? I mean, that's why I, I pointed out that Stefan Molyneux, the, uh, the right-wing commentator who appealed mainly to young white men, was not that different than woke people, right? His program, which I listened to, and I, I had a debate with Stefan Molyneux, his program was really not that different than woke stuff. It wasn't that political. If you listened to his program, it was young men would call into the program to talk about their breakup with their girlfriend, to talk about the fight that they're having with their parents, to talk about something that happened in their life. And Stefan Molyneux, with his, his British-Canadian accent, would talk about how you've been treated unfairly. You have trauma in your past. And I'm the one who understands it. And it's because you're a white man and the world is out to get white men. And the world is just unfair to you, but I'm here for you. I care for you. I, I'm the one voice who understands you. So give me your money and cut off your friends and family and don't speak to them. Just listen to my program. Just buy my products and give yourself over to me. Uh, because I'm the one who understands your trauma. I'm the one who understands your pain. That's Stefan Molyneux. Right? Um, and, you know, I thought it was weird when I debated Stefan Molyneux um, in his closing statement, he started talking about spanking. And I'm like, what in the world is this man talking about? Well, there's a reason he does that. That's a traumatic experience many young men go through, right? They were physically punished growing up, you know, they got the belt or whatever. And part of his manipulation is that these young men would call in and he would tell them about how they were abused, how they were victims, how no one understands them. They would relive a very traumatic painful experience and then he would say it's because you're a white man and it's because and, and he would use it to attach himself to them and isolate them and control them now what he was doing was aimed at young white men but it's not that different than what a lot of queer oriented social media does it's not that different than what a lot of uh you know of of you know uh, people of color or, or gender and sexism and anti-patriarchy feminist material does. It's about activating your trauma, making having you relive things in your life that went wrong, times that you were mistreated, times that you were unfairly, playing up that that's because no one understands you, except the person who's trying to exploit you and then telling you to give everything to the person who's trying to exploit you and isolate and be more and more triggered and more and more afraid of the world around you. It's a very, very nasty form of psychological manipulation. And this is largely how woke politics works, right? Um, and it's very, very damaging because the person is not healing right? The way you heal is you have better social relationships. You make friends in places you didn't think you could make friends with. You go into uncomfortable situations and you learn how to handle yourself. You develop more confidence, right? You, I mean, it's not helping the person in any way, but it's about getting the person attached to this kind of toxic social media influencer, triggering them and, and isolating them in a way that is very lucrative. Right? And it's very sinister. And the person doesn't become stronger and the person doesn't become better. And the person, the person continues to think, yes, you know, I'm different. I'm separate. I'm weird. I can't relate to anybody. In the, it, it, it's awful. It's absolutely awful. What Stefan Molyneux does to young white men, 
what, you know, various feminist podcasts do to young women, what various LGBT-oriented material do, do to young trans people and young gay people. It is really abusive, and it is self-serving. It is self-serving and it often kind of leads to a, a cycle of rage where they're, you know, on the one hand, they're playing up these people's trauma and making them afraid of the world, making them feel isolated, make them feel hopeless. On the other hand, they're inciting them against somebody all the time. There's always some transphobe out there. There's always some racist, sexist white male out there. There's always some feminists that are out there oppressing white men. Yeah, you know, there's always some, some bad guy that you are supposed to rage against. So you're, you're raging and then you're feeling powerless and weak. It's a really, really toxic mindset. And I don't want to do that to you. That is not my goal on here. I do not want you to be in that state of mind. In fact, I want the opposite for you. I want you to have healthier relationships. I want you to have a better job and a better career. I want you to be less isolated. I want you to connect with other people better than you already do. I want you to improve and become a stronger person. That's what I want for you. And I'm not playing this game because I'm not building a fandom. I'm trying to build a real community to get some real stuff done, but we'll get to that. And that's the main way that, that the left kind of handles the fact that we're not, quote unquote, normal, right? Uh, is that, you know, that it, it plays up that idea. You're, you're a special, isolated person. You're morally superior and all that. That's the main deviation in leftist politics. However, there is another deviation. And it's taken me a while to recognize it. It has taken me a while to recognize it, but I now see it for what it is. Right? And I, I first saw it when I was in the Workers' World Party and when I was friendly with people who were in the Communist Party. When I was in the Workers' World Party, our leader was a guy named Larry Holmes. And Larry Holmes was a normal guy. Larry Holmes... He watched football and baseball. He was fun to have a beer with. He could, you know, he could dance at parties. He was charming and all of that. And all the Workers World Party people were always talking about how normal Larry is. Larry is so normal. Larry is just so normal. You know, Larry, Larry, you know, he drinks beer in bars. And, you know, Larry watches football. Get, and, and it took me a long time to realize that when these older communists who were very sincere and dedicated were telling me about how normal Larry was. Oh, our leader is just so normal. You have no idea how normal our leader is. What I was hearing from them was their own shame and insecurity about what I just pointed out, them realizing they're not normal. And for a long time, the leader of the Communist Party USA was a guy named Sam Webb. Sam Webb was a rather tall man, kind of had a pot belly. He was from Connecticut and he talked like this. I'm Sam Webb, leader of the Communist Party. And Communist Party USA members would also tell me the same thing. You know, our leader, Sam Webb, he is so normal. He is just so normal. I mean, you know, he he goes hunting and fishing on the weekends. He goes, you know, hiking in the mountains and and, you know, he plays pool really well. And they just start going on and on about how normal he is. And what you were hearing when they would go on and on about how normal old Sam Webb was, was their insecurities about the fact that being a communist in America means you are not normal. And there are certain internet personalities now in the communist sphere that do the opposite, I guess, of what Stefan Molyneux does. They do the opposite of what a lot of the woke stuff does. They don't play up, oh, we're different, we're isolated, and we're persecuted. And they do the opposite. We are so normal. We are just normal, cool, healthy people. And what I'm telling you is that all of those people are weaponizing 
and manipulating the insecurities of a lot of people. And that's what they're doing. They know that there are a lot of people with communist views who think they're freaks, who think they'll never fit in, who think we're weird, that think we're nerds, that think we're... And they are manipulating and weaponizing that insecurity in order to take advantage of people. Because I have seen it, and I've seen people who fall into this spell. I saw what happened in the Workers' World Party. I saw what happened in the, uh, in the Communist Party USA. Sam Webb was a Democrat. We are going to vote for the Democratic Party. Uh, we are going to vote for, for Al Gore. We're going to vote for John Kerry. Uh, we are just going to support the Democrats. That's what we're going to do. Uh, and these older people who really believed in communism, who had big stacks of books like this, would say, are you sure we got to vote for the Democrats? You know, no, look, you're, you're weird. You're a freak. But the normal people, they want to vote for the Democrats. So you need to just vote for the Democrats. The insecurity of these people about the fact that they were communists, about the fact they felt they didn't fit in anywhere, about the fact they didn't belong, was leveraged to control them. And I saw the same thing in the Workers' World Party. All the older people actually believed in communism. All the older people, why don't we have more classes on Lenin? Why don't we, you know, why don't we sing the international at our meetings? Larry was, no, no, no. We're just going to do woke liberal rallies. See, I'm a normal guy. That's what the young people want. And people of color and, and the masses, they don't want to hear any of that communism crap. You're weird. That's why you want that is because you're weird. You're weird. And the leader was upheld as this great paragon of normal, healthy person. And the leader hated the, the rank and file. And I'll tell you, I saw that. I remember I was someplace with Larry. And my jaw dropped. And I heard him start making fun of all the older members of the Workers' World Party. All the people who donated all their money to pay his paycheck. All the people that, you know, really believed in his organization and had really read the books. I heard him just sinisterly make fun of them. They were a bunch of freaks. They were a bunch of weirdos, right? But we have to control them. And I got to realize how Larry really saw the members of his organization. And the fact that he was normal, quote unquote normal, was not an attribute. It made him a very ineffective leader of a group. The, the group basically functioned as a liberal protest club. The communist ideals and the beliefs that they held on to had long been forgotten. And their strategy was whatever the latest trendy liberal cause is, go get a permit and set up a stage and, and have a protest around it. And it was a, a hustle that he had monetized and money was coming in from different places. And these suckers, you know, that's how he viewed the older people in the group who actually believed in his cause uh, were people that had to go along with it. And they all actually believed in communism and he used their insecurities and he used their feeling that they were not normal, their feeling that they were they were weird or whatever, and their admiration of our leader is just so normal. They He used that to control them. And Sam Webb was the same way. Oh, Sam Webb, the leader of the Communist Party, he's so normal, he's so normal. And his response, if people said, maybe we shouldn't just campaign for the Democrats, maybe we should talk about communism. You're... You're not normal, okay? I don't care. You know, you got a bunch of books on Lenin and all that. Real people aren't like you. You're a freak. You're a weirdo. You're strange. People don't want that. Normal people support Barack Obama. We're going to do this, all right? We're not going to be weird. You want to be weird? You want to go join the Spot Assist League? You want to be like a homeless man out there with a crazy sign? We don't do that here. You don't want to be a freak, do you? Do what we say. You don't want to be a freak. And that weaponizing the insecurity of these people that sincerely believed in communism, that sincerely had come to these conclusions, had given their life to it, 
weaponizing that in a cynical way, making people feel ashamed of it, making them feel that there was something wrong with them and that this person, this normal leader was their superior. Larry, he's he's our superior. He's normal. You know, Sam Webb, oh, he's he's better than us. He's normal. That was the way in which these people were manipulated into not doing what they believed in. They wanted the organization to be a communist party, but their insecurity was weaponized in order to prevent it from being such. Right? Um, and that is really important because I am seeing that right now. And there are certain influencers that just go around, we're so normal, we're normal. Oh yeah, we, we don't want to be freaks, we're normal. And it's funny because you look at their followers, their followers are not normal. Their followers are not normal. Right? I There was one of these people that actually began his speech at an event I was at. And he said, I'm so glad to see so many normal people in the audience. I looked out at the audience and I thought, there's no normal people here, right? There's probably a lot of people in this audience that are on the spectrum. There's a lot of people in this audience who have traveled internationally. There's a lot of people in this audience that consume alternative media, that, that are really educated about philosophy. I don't see any normal people at this event at all. That's how he began his speech. And I thought, is he looking at the same crowd that I'm looking at? Well, now I understand what he was doing. He was playing on the insecurity of all of those people in the audience. That's what he was doing. They were all there. And they all were probably thinking, oh, I'm the only person in here who's weird. I hope no one notices me. And the promise is if you follow this influencer, if you follow them, you can be normal. They'll help you be normal. People will think you're normal if you follow this person. That's the promise. And I got to tell you, this person has the exact same attitude toward all of their fans. The exact same attitude. They're a bunch of freaks. They're a bunch of weirdos. People who read books about Russia. People who know the history of Marx and Lenin. What weirdos are that? I, you know, I, and it's the same shit. And this is really the inverse of the other deviation. The, uh, the one deviation is you're so weird, no one can ever understand you, and so you must follow me. And the other deviation is I'm normal, and deep down, you know you're not normal. You know you're a freak. You know you think about things, and so you better do what I say because I look normal, and I'm better than you, and you better follow me, and you better do what I say, and you better... Because I, I am the normal one, and, and through me, maybe I can help you to be normal, which is not going to happen. And these are both very sinister, cynical manipulations intended to make money. I'm just being real with you. I didn't say tonight was going to be an easy night. I did not say tonight was going to be easy, that I was going to tell you all things you wanted to hear. I'm telling you that, that this is a sore point that a lot of us in anti-imperialist politics have. We have it in our head that we are not normal and that there are bad actors who see that weakness and smell blood and use it to get us into manipulative fandoms and take advantage of us, right? Um, and that that's just a fact. I'm just telling you that this is going on. But now I have to tell you, what, what do we do about it? What do we do about it? Because, I mean, this is not the first, the first uh, time we've ever had this conversation. I'm here to tell you you're not normal, and I don't want you to be normal. I want you to be exceptional. That's what I want for you. I want you to be exceptional. And I'll, I'll let me explain. All right? During the 1970s, there was a mass... There was a, a layer of thousands of people who became interested in communism. They were called the New Communist Movement. I talk about it in the CPI textbook. And the Revolutionary Communist Party, the October League, the, the Communist Labor Party. It was a layer of people. 
And the main strategy that the new communist movement had is their members would get jobs in factories and try to be normal and, and try to just be an ordinary worker in the factory, know the most about baseball and football, go to the bar and drink with their workers, their co-workers, um, you know, and, and it got to be funny. People made fun of how ridiculous these communist groups went with the I want to be normal shtick in the 1970s. Uh, there was a joke that, you know, the Revolutionary Communist Party, the RCP, took this to the to the most ridiculous extremes. There's many stories where, you know, there was a meeting of different communist groups. People are going around. What group are you from? I'm from the Workers World Party. What group are you from? I'm from the Communist Party USA. And then you'd get to the RCP person. What group are you from? Well, I'm just an ordinary working man. That's right. And and of course, these all these are generally people who went to Harvard and Yale. These are generally people that, you know, that, you know, you know, have stacks of the complete works of Lenin in their house. They're not, but they would put on a big show of being normal and they would, you know, they would wear baseball caps with beer companies on them because that was a very working class thing to do. They would wear flannel shirts because that's what poor working class truck drivers wear, you know, and it was kind of stupid. Uh, it was kind of stupid and over the top. But the idea was that they would become popular with their co-workers by being normal because they knew about sports or they knew about, about beer or whatever. They would become popular with their co-workers in the plant, but then a crisis would happen in the plant. And then all the workers would rally around them to leave. Well, here's the thing, folks. Let's say that you had a very rare form of cancer. What would you want to cure you of the cancer? Would you want somebody who is just like you? Boy, I've got cancer. I've got a disease called cancer. I'm going to go find a guy in the bar who is just like me, who watches football. That'll cure me of the cancer. Of course not. You're going to want to find a doctor. In fact, you're probably going to want to find a specialist. You're not looking for a normal person to cure the cancer. You're looking for somebody who really knows the issue. Someone who takes it very seriously. In the classroom, is the teacher the same as the kids in the classroom? Is the teacher the same? No. If the teacher was the same, they wouldn't have anything to teach the kids. Now would they? When you go to the doctor, is the doctor that you see, are they the same as you? Do you have the same level of knowledge that they have? Did you go to medical school also? Of course not. When a crisis breaks out and people are looking to mobilize resistance, they're not going to go look for somebody who's just like them. They're going to go look for somebody who has something to offer them. Somebody who has something to teach them. Somebody who can help solve the problem. And this approach that the new communist movement had of we're going to sound like workers, we're gonna, it, it was an incorrect approach. And there was another organization that existed during these years called the National Caucus of Labor Committees. It was run by Lyndon LaRouche. They were calling themselves Marxists, but they were widely attacked by the, by the new communist movement, by the Maoists. And one of the attacks against them is they said to them, why is all your literature always talking about fixing things in the country? Why is all your literature always talking about fixing things? Because it was true. They put forward proposals to fix things in the country infrastructure projects to revitalize the economy, financial bailouts and economic you know, programs, building a national bank. And they'd say, why, why is all of your newspaper, you're supposed to be communists, but your newspaper is all about how to save the country. Why are you trying to save the system? We shouldn't want to save the system. We should want it to all fall apart. We want a revolution. We want it, we want it to all fall. Why are you trying to save the Western imperialist system? Why are you trying to save this country? And the LaRouche people explained, why would working people follow us if we were trying to make their lives worse? And that points to the difference between the old left, the Communist Party in the 1930s, 
and the new left. Right? Even though those Maoists were trying to model themselves on the Communist Party, if you go and read an old, you know, you read Twilight of World Capitalism by William Z. Foster, right? This is a Communist Party book from the 19, 1950s. There's nothing in here about destroying the country. And if you read what he talks about, about what socialism would be like, it's about making the country better. And the people from the National Caucus of Labor Committees were talking about making the country better. And their newspaper, New Solidarity, and their pamphlets and their literature always had all kinds of proposals about new high-speed railway that could be built, nuclear energy, national banking, different ways that they could take dramatic economic reforms to make life better in the country. And that was their approach. And they also didn't try to dumb themselves down. They didn't try to sound like they were, like they were, you know, they were just an ordinary person. They tried to sound like they were smart, like they knew what they were talking about. You know, when I was a, um, when I was in, in a communist group, I remember that, um, the communist group I was in, I was in the Workers World Party, they attacked the Service Employees International Union. They, they said this, the SEIU, this labor union, why do they always have their labor union organizers wear suits? That is so bourgeois. And that is so, oh, that is so anti-working class. When an SEIU organizer comes to knock on your door or comes to your workplace to, to handle a, a workplace grievance proceeding or whatever, they wear a suit. And that is just so, so anti-working class. Well, that was not correct. It is not anti-working class. Because, you know, if you get arrested and you hire a lawyer to represent you in court, that lawyer is going to wear a suit. And if a member of city, someone who's running for city council knocks on your door and says, I'm running for city council. I'd like you to vote for me. They are going to wear a suit. And the labor unions that are much more successful than any of these little tiny communist groups have realized that if they want to look like an organization that can really help working class people, they have to look serious and they have to look professional. They have to look like somebody who will get the job done. And so that doesn't mean they put on flannels. It doesn't mean they put on beer hats. Oh, I'm an ordinary worker. No, it means they put on a suit and a tie and they look like professionals who will represent you well and get you, you know, the, the, the deal that you need to represent you in your grievance proceeding, get you a contract that'll, that'll respect you on the job. They are not trying to look like they're just like you. They're trying to look like a professional who can get the job done. Right. And this is, I don't want an organization of people that are normal. I want an organization of people that are exceptional or people that are extraordinary. That's what I want. I want a group of people that know more about world politics than most people. I want an organization of people that know more about economics than most people, but they are connected enough and they have the social skills and they have the understanding and the professionalism to explain things and educate people in an effective way. That's what I want. I want an organization full of people that people will look up to and they'll say they know their shit and they're representing us and they're pointing us in the right direction. That's what I want. I don't want an organization of normal people. I want an organization of people that are very effective, very articulate, very professional, very good at dealing with people, very good at communicating with people, very knowledgeable, but not know-it-all-ish, very, very tuned into the realities of life, very capable of engaging with people, very capable of listening and learning from the masses of people and understanding their perspective. I want all of that, and none of that is normal. None of that's normal. None of that is normal and none of that comes naturally. None of that comes naturally. Right? 
none of you don't naturally become a very effective organizer you learn by doing you don't naturally become really good at explaining marxist economics you learn by doing you don't naturally become good at convincing people to oppose a war you learn by doing and part of learning is being able to speak to people in many different walks of life being able to relate to people being able to use terms that people can understand and frame things in way people can get it but that's not the same as being normal in fact that means that's being abnormal that's being exceptional you have to understand what you're saying and you have to understand the person you're speaking to and you have to understand them well enough and what you're saying well enough to communicate it in the most effective way. That's skill. Being able to do that well is exceptional, is extraordinary. It's not ordinary. And I'm telling you, the way that you will become that is by doing it. You have to just do it. Right? I am thankful for the fact that I joined communist groups because they made me go out on the street and sell newspapers to people. I was shy when I first do it, did it. I was nervous. I was convinced that people were going to punch me in the face for being a communist. That's what I was convinced was going to be the case, but I got good at doing it by just doing it over and over and over again. And being a revolutionary is a journey of self-improvement. And you know what? I was with the Revolutionary Communist Party. I was around them. They taught me to sell newspapers, to go out on the street and sell newspapers. And then when I was in college, uh, I ended up getting a job, uh, you know, from the alumni fund and calling up alumni and getting them to donate. And I was good at doing it because I had the sales experience of going out on the street for hours every Saturday and every Sunday and every day after class and selling the newspaper to people in real life. And in fact, when I first moved to New York, I got a job in sales, in, in marketing at an insurance firm, and I was very good at it. And why was I very good at it? I was good at it because in the communist movement, I had learned to go out and engage with people and my skills improved. And that was good, but it improved because I went out and did it, right? And I tell people that the communist movement saved my life. And it honestly did. If they hadn't given me the push and made me go out and hand out leaflets and made me go out and hand out posters and made me go out and sell newspapers and made me go out and sell books, if they hadn't done that, I never would have re realized that I had the skill. I never would have developed it. And I never would have would have come out of my shell. And I never would have learned to explain these ideas. You know, when I would read Marxist books, when I would learn new concepts, I'd be constantly thinking in my head, how could I explain this to my family members? How could I explain this to somebody at my college? How could I explain this to one of my coworkers? When I'm out leafleting about this, how, when somebody disagrees with me, what am I going to say back to them? And it was only by doing it that I got any better at this. And it is a great journey of self-improvement. But was I learning to be normal? No, I was not learning to be normal. I was definitely not learning to be normal. I was learning to be better at what I did. The older communists that I knew, Frances Dostal was an old woman. Her parents had been members of the Communist Party. She had been a founding member of the Workers' World Party. She was from Brooklyn, New York, and she could talk to anyone. And she told me, you know, being like a communist means you have to be able to talk to anybody, Caleb. You got to be able to represent our line to anybody. And she could talk to anybody. And one of the first things she did whenever she met somebody was she asked them about their job. What do you do for a living? And she would listen to what they did for a living very carefully. And she later told me that I should do that whenever I met somebody. And she said, don't, you know, ask anyone you meet. If you meet somebody, ask them about their job. 
And don't just do it to give them an opportunity to talk. Do it so that you know. Because if you are going to be an organizer of the working class, you need to know what a day in the life of a working class person is. You need to know what they do at their job every day, what their job is like. You need to know that. And if you're going to understand the economy, right? If you're going to understand the capitalist economy, you need to know what people are doing for work. So when you meet someone, ask them about their job, make them tell you what a day at their job is like, what a typical day is like, what a stressful day at their job is like, what an easy day at their job is like, whether the pay goes up, what, how their pay can go up. Find out everything you can because it's not simply a matter of being interested in them to gain their trust or something like that. It's a matter of knowing it so that you can be an effective organizer. Because Marxism, Marxism is about economics. It's about the economy. It's about the means of production. And your job is to know that. And so you need to be out there knowing what people have to say. And you need to be interested in what people do with their job. And you need to be knowledgeable about it. And you need to understand that. You need to be able to relate that. And you can incorporate that knowledge into your agitation. This is what they taught me. And this is brilliant. This has been amazingly helpful to me in learning to interact with people, in learning to engage with people, in learning to do marketing. And, and, and all of this is skills that I learned through being an activist, through being an organizer, through being in a group, by having people push me to do things I didn't think I was capable of doing. By having people in, teach me to engage with other people, this is all things that I was taught. And these are all things that have really helped me in every, every field of my life. I have better conversations with people because I was forced to go out and organize as a communist. I, I, I have better knowledge of ways to interact with people. I, I've learned to explain things in different ways. I, this is all really important. And it, it is the journey of self-improvement that all of us are on. Being a revolutionary organizer is a journey of self-improvement. And it's not a journey to become normal. It's a journey about how to become extraordinary enough to relate and organize and influence normal people. That's what we're trying to do. It is about gaining the skills the insights, the relatability to really be effective, to convey very important and sometimes very complex and, and you know, very unfamiliar ideas to normal people. That is what we are trying to do. And we are aiming to be exceptional, not to be normal. And we are aiming to be the specialist that the masses go to when things become intolerable. I've often said that revolutionaries are a lot like dentists. Most people would never want to go to a dentist. They would never want to go to a dentist. They don't like the drill. It's gross. But you get that cavity that's so bad, you go and find a dentist. And when the crisis comes, that's us, folks. That's us. We have to be the dentist that the masses run to when conditions are intolerable. As things get worse, they go and find the revolutionary. They go and find the dentist who will get that cavity out. They go and find the revolutionary who they resisted. They said, no, I don't want to hear this. No, it can't be that bad. And, and no, communism can't be the end. And, and they finally, they go and find that dentist. And they say, you know what? You were right. You were right. I got to get the cavity out. You were right. We got to have a socialist revolution. And we got to be that person. And that person they run to is not going to be their favorite beer drinker. And that person that they run to is not going to be somebody who's just like them. That person they run to is going to be somebody who has shown them that they know their shit, has won their trust, has advocated on their behalf before, 
and won battles on their behalf before. That's who that person is going to be. And I want you to be that person. I want you to be the person in your neighborhood, in your workplace, in your family, in your university, who people will go to when they are angry and they're looking for answers. I want you to be that person. And being that person, that means you can't look crazy. You can't look like a lunatic. They're not going to go to a lunatic. It means you can't speak incoherently and sound like you're, you, you're, you're just saying things that are not useful to them. No, that means that you are going to have to win the trust of your coworkers, win the trust of your friends and your classmates, win the trust of the people in your neighborhood, win the trust of the people at your school, at your university, by being able to give them answers to their political questions, by putting forward solutions, not, oh, we need a violent revolution, but putting forward real solutions that make sense to them, to the problems that are facing their lives, a transitional program, a four-point economic plan, being able to put forward something that they could see happening that would actually improve their lives. That's what you got to do. Right? You have got to learn to be exceptional and to be exceptional in the way that you can engage with people and you can explain things and you can win them over. That's what that's what I want for you. That's what I want for you. And there are people that are trying to weaponize your feelings of isolation. And there are people for for a variety of reasons. There are people that that are going to play on your insecurities. There are people that are going to try to isolate you into a fandom. I want you to be an organizer. Let me just put it this way. I keep coming back to this lately. There are two ways that I'm aware of that you can find happiness in this world. First way is to have real friendship, to have real love, real connection with others. To have somebody that you're there for them when they're suffering, they're there for you when you're suffering, you make each other laugh, you hold each other up to have that kind of bond with another person, whether it's a spouse, whether it's a, a family member, whether it's a good friend, whether it's someone you work with in an organization, to have the kind of bond with another person, to have love with another person. That is the first way that you can find happiness. And the second way you can find happiness is by creating building something, inventing something, designing something, helping make something happen. That's the other way that you can find happiness. Putting on an event, writing something, singing a beautiful piece of music, making a beautiful work of art, teaching a group of people and helping them learn something making a contribution to the world, creating, making the world better. That's the second way. The first way is to love and the second is to create. Those are the two ways that you can find happiness. And I've got to tell you that the whole reason the Center for Political Innovation exists is to help you do those two things, to help you have people that you can work with, comrades, that you can struggle with and organize with and develop a bond, have a similar interest in the politics and the history and the and the and all this stuff we talk about on these streams. I want you to develop a bond with other people. And as an organization, we are all about creating. We put on events, conferences, weekend workshops. We have outreach projects that we do. We, we publish books. We are all about creating. We're here to give love and we're here to come together to create. That is why we exist as an organization. We exist to 
help people find comradely love and connection. And we also exist to create and to go out and create and engage in operations to educate and spread the anti-imperialist message. And so if you want to be part of our group, our group will do its best to try and bring you happiness in these two ways. Now, I can't guarantee it will always go smoothly. People disagree with each other. People, people are not happy. People were looking for something and they didn't get it. People were unsatisfied. People were, I mean, it happens. And that happens in any organization that you've ever been in. Every church, every bowling league, every sports club, everything, everything. Right? People, people are unhappy. Sometimes. But our goal is to help you to find happiness and find satisfaction in life while promoting the worldview of anti-imperialism and innovationism that is the way to the future. And that is what we seek to do. We seek to facilitate that. So take it or leave it. That's what we offer. But one thing I will not do is I will not pretend that I'm going to try and make you normal. I will not exacerbate your insecurities about your perceived abnormality. And I will not try to tell you that somehow we are going to be normal. We're going to be exceptional in this organization. And I, my goal is for you to be as exceptional as possible in every aspect of your life. I want you to be the best, most successful person at your job. I want you to have a high income. I want you to have a great marriage and a great spouse. I want you to have really good friends that you can bond with. And the better you're doing, the better I'm doing. The happier you are, the happier our organization is. The more successful you are, the more successful our organization is. The more confident you are, the more confident you are, the better outreach you're able to do as our organization. It is in my interest as the leader of the Center for Political Innovation for you to do well. You are on a journey of self-improvement, trying to find a life with more love in it, trying to find a life with more creativity in it. And I view the Center for Political Innovation as an organization that can help you do those things. And if you want to come along, feel free. And people have their hardships. People have to step away. People have to come back. But, but I'm warning you, and this has come up a lot recently, watch out for anybody who is playing on your insecurities and playing on your fears of not being normal or points to being normal as some kind of ideal, or worse, tries to isolate you and tell you you'll never fit in or whatever, watch out for that. Because there's a lot of, a lot of vampires out there. There's a lot of vampires out there who want to tear you down. They want to tear you down. And I'm telling you that CPI ain't going to work unless we build you up. We are here to build you up. We are not here to tear you down. And if this is going to work, we're going to build you up. And I'm here because I got built up. I got built up. The communist groups I was in, as, as much as I was frustrated and disappointed by with them, with them they built me up. And I am the product of people who taught me. I am the product of people who nudged me. I am the product of people who pressured me to do things I didn't want to do, who told me I had to do things I didn't want to do, who challenged me intellectually, who pushed me into uncomfortable circumstances. And as weird as it is, I appreciate it. There are things I would never do as an organization that... Were done to me, and you know what? I'm better off for it. All right? I was sent out on the street to sell newspapers when I was underage. You know, 
you got to be 18 to be in CPI. That's one of our basic rules. But when I was 15 years old, they had me out on the street selling communist newspapers. That's probably illegal. Right. You know, we didn't get to keep the money. I'll tell you that much. And, you know, I mean, we weren't getting paid or and I was underage. That was probably illegal. So what? I'm glad they did it. It saved my life. And I do want to point something out, too. Right. And this is this is something that that it's weird for people to this is this is a weird one. Right. But, you know, in Greek. There are three words for love. There's agabe, right? Which is like the love of knowledge, the love of God and man. That's the one that people always talk about. There's uh, eros, which is romantic love. That's where the word erotic comes from. Sexual or romantic love is eros. But there's also philia, philos or filial love, right? Now, what does the word filial mean? This is this is an important word, right? Because it's a really important word in in Asian cultures, right? It is the uh, filial is the the love due from a son or daughter, right? Um, the word filial refers to the the love that a son or daughter has for their parent. But filial love is not only between biological parents and biological children, right? In Asian cultures, they really emphasize the concept of filial piety to teachers, filial piety between the people of a country and their leaders of the country. And it is a love that develops out of admiration. It is, it is a humility. When we talk about filialness, it is a humility and a love for those leading you. And it is love from those leading you to those they are leading. It is the love that a, a king has for the nation. It is the love that a that a that a, a father has for his children. It is the love that a, that students have for their teacher. It refers to a relationship between leaders and led that is a healthy one that has obligations that go both ways. And I would say the ultimate filial relationship is love between God, our creator and man. And that my, my ability to keep going in life and my ability to march forward in life really improved when I returned to God. When I could love God again, when I could look up at God the way a child looks up at their parent and I could love God again and I could take God's leadership, it really improved things for me. And that as a young man, it was very hard. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Malcolm X and this didn't happen. It was something made up for the movie, right? But in the movie Malcolm X, uh, one of the hard things about Malcolm X in the in the movie is that when he's a Muslim, he has to pray, he has to get on his knees and pray, and he's just too proud to do it. Well, that didn't happen because the nation of Islam doesn't do Salat. They don't pray the way Muslims normally pray. So that never happened. But they put it in the movie because it's something that a lot of people can relate to, right? Especially a lot of young men can relate to. You don't want to bow before anybody. You don't want to look up to anyone as your leader. You want to show that you're tough. You want to you want to show that nobody can kick you around. You want to be the boss. And that that's an important part of Oedipal feelings. It's an important part of going out on your own. That's an important part of asserting your independence from your parents and proving your way in the world. And those feelings are necessary. But you can't do that your whole life. And it's a burden that you have to carry around. Young men especially. It might be that way for women too. I think there's a lot of women that have similar feelings. But for men that I know... They carry this burden on their shoulder. They carry a bag of bricks around on their shoulder everywhere because they cannot be filial. They cannot have a parent or a teacher or a father figure. They cannot have a God in heaven that they look up to. They have to be all on their own and they have to show everybody that no one can listen. That they've got something to prove. 
And I'm telling you, you will get to a point in your life where you can put that bag of bricks down. And when you can do that, and you can say, you know what, I have the humility to be led. I want to please my teacher, and my teacher wants to teach me. I want to please God, and God wants me to do the best that I can. When you can get to that point, when you can have filial love again, you will be much happier and you will be a much better organizer. And that is the first step toward becoming a leader. To really be a leader, you have to know how to be led. It sounds like a contradiction, but it's true. If you want to be a leader, you have to let yourself be led. And you have to be led by others. And you have to see what a real leader can offer. And you have to understand what it's like to not be the leader. And to know what you need from a leader. I think Jesus in the Bible, he said, whoever wants to be first should make himself last and serve others. And that is true. If you want to be first, make yourself last. And this is this is something, and maybe what I'm saying right now, you just think, hey, Caleb, you're, you're rambling on there and all that. That's fine. Maybe you're not ready to hear this, but I am telling you. I am telling you that when you can have filial love, not erotic love, not, you know, the, but, but filial love. When you can have filial love, when you can, you can take leadership from God, when you can take leadership from a teacher or a mentor, and you can want to please them, and they can want to bring out the best in you, and you can have a positive leader and led relationship. If you can experience that, it'll be like a ton of bricks are lifted off your shoulder. And you will be so relieved if you can do that. I am telling you, if you can take the burden of having to prove something, of showing that you know it all and nobody can listen to you and you should be the one who's in charge and you are, if you can take that burden off your shoulders. You can be a much happier person. And it may not seem that way. And, it, and if it doesn't seem that way, you're not ready yet. And you can only do it when you're ready. You can't fake it. But when you're ready to really take that burden off your shoulders and to just have the kind of relationship that Socrates had with his students, that Jesus had with his disciples, that, you know, that, that, great revolutionary leaders had with their revolutionary organizations. To have the kind of relationship that, that Mao had with the people who went with him on the long march. To have the kind of relationship that, you know, Fidel Castro had with the men who went with him on that ship, the, the grandma, and went into Cuba, right? That, that ship that they, they launched their uprising with. To have that kind of relationship, the leader and the led, when you can have that kind of relationship, you will be happy. You know, when I was um, when I was in Iran, I saw the supreme leader of Iran speak, and um, you know, um, and. I saw the Supreme Leader of Iran speak and, and the way people spoke when he walked into the room, they started crying as soon as he walked into the room and his presence in the room, it just hit them. 
and the same for the same for Kim Il Sung. I never went to North Korea. There was a friend of mine who went to North Korea in the 1980s. And he described how he was at a factory. They took him to a factory on the day that Kim Il Sung, the leader of the Korean Revolution, visited the factory. And, you know, Korea, culturally, the people are very expressive with their emotions. Right? Different cultures are different. And when Kim Il Sung came to the factory, the tears just poured from the faces of working class people. And they just cried. In, in love for Kim Il-sung. Right? That is a kind of love. That's filial love. He is their leader who led them against the imperialists, who led them against Japan, who led them against U.S. imperialism, who oversaw the industrialization of the country. And when Kim Il-sung walked into their factory, people just sobbed. They just cried. They just cried. That is a special relationship. And when I was in Russia, I saw that kind of relationship with Putin. The way Putin, the way when he walks into the room and the way people look at him and the way they, they, they listen attentively when he speaks and the way they smile as he speaks, that's, they have a filial relationship. This is a really big thing in Eastern culture. They talk about filial piety and all of that. We've gotten away from that in the West. We've gotten away from that. And you say, oh, if you think that way, you're in a cult. This is totalitarianism. You're being brainwashed. Well, that's great. And look at us here in the West. We're all thinking for ourselves, right? And there is no truth. And we're all sitting at home on our phones being triggered by Stefan Molyneux or some commentator. And, there, and there, there's no God for us to bow before. And there's no, there's no leader who's mobilizing us to build the country and make things better. And there's no one challenging us to do better. And we're just sitting there looking at our phones going, oh, yeah, I'm doing great. I'm just doing great. You know, I'm just so happy here in the West, right? With all of our opioids and all of our pornography and our pessimism and our are, you know, oh, we're all just a cancer on Mother Earth and we're, we're thinking for ourselves. Oh, we're thinking for ourselves. Nobody's telling us how to think. We're doing our own thing. And oh, it's we're just so happy. We're just so great and free here in the West, aren't we? I mean, no, no filial piety, no cause to believe in, no truth, no sacrifice, no working hard to please a leader. No, none of this. Oh, no, we're just doing, we're just fit as a fucking fiddle, as they say. We are fit as a fucking fiddle. We're just doing great here in the West. Well, I'm telling you, I've talked about the Freudian concept of parental transference. Now I'm talking about the Eastern concept of filial piety. But I'm telling you that we are missing something as a society. We are missing something. We are missing something. But I hope, amid everything that I just said for the last 90 minutes, that you understand why it is that I don't want you to be normal and I want you to have a healthier relationship a healthier relationship with this concept of normal people and normality. 